It's time for this week's episode of Brandon Sports Talk. Welcome back to Brandon Sports Talk. In today's episode, I have the privilege to interview the Albany State's head men's basketball coach, Coach Patrick Gale. How are you doing today? Great, Brandon. How are you? I'm doing good. Can you talk about how you knew that you wanted to get started in coaching and college basketball? Well, actually, that's a great question. I was actually uh, walking on campus, University of Memphis, and I spoke to an academic advisor, and I was actually a uh, engineering major. And my advisor said, hey, you've got some really great math grades, but not so great engineering grades. Why don't you look at getting a math degree and being a, a, a big you know, basketball player and fan? I said, you know what? I can be a basketball coach and a math teacher. And that's what got, it, that's what got me started in coaching. So I've literally coached at every level. I think a week from that point, when I was in college, I coached at the East Memphis YMCA, coaching five and six year olds. And just to see five and six year olds actually, you know, execute something that you give them, that that made me fall in love with coaching. What was it like getting started in college coaching without going and playing college co- basketball? It it it's actually a better education in coaching. Um, it, it got me to learn from a lot of different people. Um, I was judged from, from jump. So everything that every, every, accolade, every opportunity that I received was earned, was hard earned. It wasn't given. Nobody cared about who I was. They looked at me and they made a judgment on me. And, you know, to get players to, to get better, you have to have some type of credibility. And I think, you know, them seeing that, wait a second, this guy actually can can get me better. This guy has actually coached some guys that, you know, came from out of nowhere and, and, and achieved a lot. It, it was, it was, it was actually a better education in coaching. Coaching really has less to sport and more to do with how you teach and how you, you know, relate to, to uh, players and people. What was it like falling in love with college basketball and getting started in college coaching besides obviously not playing? It was a dream. I mean, I've been, I'm, I'm from New York. So we, we, we play basketball, you know, from, you know, three years old. So it was a dream. I mean, I, I'm a big, big, big East fan. So I've always been in love with college basketball, probably more so than the NBA because a lot of those guys that were stars in the big East became NBA players. And the only reason we followed them was because of, you know, them being in the big East. So it was a dream to, to talk to, guys in the business that you grew up idolizing. But the biggest thing that I always go back to, what I've learned is that, you know, the names are, are one thing, but the, the game is the same. The sport is, it stays the same. So just that love of basketball, that's kind of what gets me up every day. How is it like getting your first start at Tiffany University? Well, that, that, that you know, I, I remember to this day uh, getting that, that, um, that interview with uh, Coach Martin, I was actually teaching <laughs> in a class, and and I took his call, and you know I thought I, I bombed the interview because he asked me the question, "How old are you?" And I said, oh, "I'm 30 years old." So I'm thinking nobody wants a 30 year old grad assistant. And when and when he said, "You're 30," that's perfect. And I was like, "Whoa!" Because I guess he wanted somebody more mature. So it was a dream come true. It was a rough season, but it, I've learned so much from Coach Martin. Um, that was a great opportunity. I'm forever grateful to him. Um, and, and, you know, being a 30-year-old grad assistant, you know, it was humbling, but it was also, you know, just a great experience. And I was ready for that experience. Let's just put it that way. How did, obviously, your time at Tiffany help you to where you went to at St. Thomas becoming the head coach? Well, I, the, 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 it was crazy because um, I was in Ohio at Tiffin. And when, you know, one day walking into my office, 
um, Coach uh, Tate, uh, who was the assistant coach at the time, was speaking to uh, Clark Maloney at St. Thomas University looking for an assistant. And I actually, my family, my parents were down in Florida. So he didn't really want to relocate from Ohio to Florida. But, you know, he knew that, you know, me being, you know, older, I was looking to maybe do that. And so it was kind of like the perfect situation, the perfect match. And, you know, he said, well, I can't take the job, but I got a guy that, that might be willing to go down to Florida and the rest is history. And, you know, from going from having a tough year at Tiffin to winning the conference the following year at St. Thomas University, it was, it was kind of like that was a godsend. What was it like when you got that head coaching job for the first time in your coaching career? Well, that was all, that was all Clark Maloney. That was all, you know, him preparing me for the four years that I was an assistant, you know, at St. Thomas University and, and telling me, you know what, you can do this, you can do this. And, you know, I went from, you know, not questioning, but just kind of just wanting to be a sponge to, you know, gaining confidence and winning does that. And, you know, we, we got, you know, my last year as his assistant, we broke the record for school win and, you know, I coached a lot of great players over those four years, so I felt confident about it. I was named the interim um, head coach, so it wasn't something that was promised. Um, so I had to go and improve myself, and I'm proud of you know what I accomplished in, in just getting that job. It wasn't easy to keep that job. I tell a lot of young coaches, you know, getting a job is one thing, keeping the job is another. What was that feeling like whenever you obviously got the job and you moved seats from being assistant coach and then obviously being in the driver's seat? You do not know. Your head coach shields you from a lot of the stuff you have to deal with being an assistant. And my advice to all assistants, and we, we have a term in the coaching profession called 12, 12 inches over. You have no idea what it's like being a head coach. So it was, it was a whirlwind at first. I, I spoke to, you know, Coach Maloney. I spoke to Coach Martin. And I was like, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize it. But it's something that, you know, you take it day by day. And once you get through that first year, I think you kind of get, you know, you get that confidence for the rest of the years that you're a head coach. But, you know, it's, it's very tough. It's a very, very tough transition that you're not ready for. You just have to do it. During your time at St. Thomas, what was it like going to the Sweet 16? It was a great feeling. Um, when I first was an assistant at St. Thomas, we lost, you know, at the buzzer. And we didn't get back to the national tournament until, um, you know, three years later. And then we did, you know, get to the Sweet 16. So to do that, you know, my first year as a head coach, it was a great feeling. And honestly, Brandon, you don't, you, coaches always say stay in the moment, but as a coach in a tournament, you're trying to win the next game. I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have because, you know, being at Albany State, you know, it's, it's tough to win. So, you know, I look back and I regret not really enjoying that moment as much as I should have because of how hard it is, you know, to win and to be one of the top 16 teams remaining in the country. How was it like, obviously, going to back-to-back -back division titles? Well, you know, again, it's <laughs> in the moment, it's something that you're like, you're, you're happy, but that's only you know, temporary because you're thinking about, you know, the next season or the next game. But, you know, anytime you win, it's, it's, it's the best thing in the world. It's what we do it for. It's, what, it's why you work so hard. And when you don't taste it, it's like you're starving. It's like you're in the desert, you know, searching for a drink of water. But, you know, winning does a, a crazy thing to a coach. It, no, no coach can tell you that they've experienced winning and won anything else other than that experience. So that's the biggest thing is just, you know, winning, you know, division here, my, my second year at Albany State, you know, that, that, that seems like it was so far away, but in the moment, I wish I would have enjoyed it more. I didn't enjoy it as much, but I wish I would have enjoyed it more because it's very hard to do. What was it like getting the head coaching job at Albany State? You know what? It was, it was something that, you know, I, I talked to a lot of my mentors. I, 
I talked to my family and I thought it was the right time, you know, to make that transition into an NCAA D2. Um, again, a lot more work than I thought it would have been. Um, I did, you know, take a lot of my, my winning ways from, you know, uh, St. Thomas over to Albany State. And, you know, I love, it. now that I've been here four years, I, I have alums now here and they still come around the program. And I, I'm so grateful that they're around, you know, Napoleon Harris, Randy McClure, Camille Brown, Jawan High, Mario Young, those guys, you know, built the foundation of, of what this program is all about. So, you know, taking this head job, it was a new challenge, you know, something I had to get used to, you know, being in another state. And, you know, by the grace of God, I'm, I'm still here. What was it like, obviously, building the culture and creating the culture as the head coach? It was a fight. It was, it was very difficult. Um, that's the hardest thing that a head coach can do. And, you know, building your culture, it doesn't even matter what you take over. It doesn't matter the record. It doesn't matter the environment. It's going to be yours now. So just building your culture is difficult because everybody has to get used to you. So, you know, obviously there are a lot of, you know, um, I don't want to say confrontations, but there's, there was a lot of adversity and, you know, just, it's kind of like the tournament, survive in advance to another day. So every day that I can walk in the office, it's, it's a success. It's a win because it's an opportunity con to continue to build on that culture. Of course, what does a typical game day look like for Albany State? Well, a game day for the players is a lot different from the game day from the coach. So I always tell my players that my game day is the day before the game because that's the last time that I'm going to have the whole day and their whole attention for the game the next day. Because I don't have any, you know, I don't have any control of what they do on the floor. I do in practice. I can stop at any time. We can walk through. We can go over, you know, the day before. But for the game day. I don't have any control. So it definitely starts with me with, you know, getting up and trying to meet with, you know, a couple of the guys, a couple of the seniors or captains or guys, that I feel, you know, may have a different role than they had the last game or may have an important role and, and just kind of watch a little film and talk to them about what I expect out of them. Then we prepare for shoot around. So, you know, I have to watch that, you know, little bit of film that I feel like maybe I, you know, I, I may be overlooking. So I may watch film from years past. I may watch their last game just to give them that last bit of information before we go into shoot around. And then we, we, we walk, we go through a shoot around, we go through a film session, and then we come back for a pregame meal. We we'll, we'll also watch film because I'll add some stuff to that film. And then as when they leave that film session, my control is over and it's basically game prep. It's just, you know, doing our pregame, you know, um, ritual and warm up, And then we just, we get to the game. Who are some of the teams that you faced in your conference? Well, very good teams. Uh, first and foremost, the team that won our division, our side, Morehouse, um, the team that, that uh, got to the highest um, regional ranking, uh, Miles, college and then um, you have Benedict College that had a very good year should have been in the NCAA regionals um, you have Tuskegee that that did pretty well as well um, Savannah State uh, won our conference tournament they are very well coached have great uh, talent um, Clark Atlanta University is a very tough team for Valley you know that's our rival they're a very tough team also very well coached um, we have two divisions. So on the east side, we have uh, Fort Valley, Clark, Morehouse, Benedict. Um, Allen will be joining our conference. And um, on the west side, you have Miles, Tuskegee, Lane, Lemoyne, Owen, um, Spring Hill, and Kentucky State. Of course, with those teams that are in your conference, what is it like, obviously, traveling to them? And what is that travel distance like? Very good question. It's a it's a gauntlet. Um, our our farthest trip is probably um, I said Kentucky State. Also should have said uh, Central State as well because that's that's their travel partner. It's it's a, it's a grueling drive. So um, that that trip uh, is like 
we're leaving from Georgia, going all the way to Kentucky and going all the way to Ohio. Um, in our division, um, we have um, our, our longest trip is to South Carolina to play Benedict and Allen University. That's also uh, joining our conference along with Edward Waters. So it's, it's, it can be grueling. It can be grueling. It's just very tough. We play the uh, West Division once and we play the uh, East Division universities uh, twice, home and away. So it's a tough, it's a tough uh, gauntlet to get through. What's it like, obviously, playing teams like Benedict? They have a great atmosphere. The last time we played them, they were ready to play, and they they uh, ran us off the floor. They have a great atmosphere. One thing that a lot of coaches and players don't understand is the HBCU environment. It is not the same as any other environment. Um, the band, um, the, the fans, the the atmosphere, it's electric, it's intimidating. Um, if you're not ready to go, you will get embarrassed. And um, they'll let you know about it from start to finish. So you have to be mentally tough. You have to be physically tough. The officiating is tough. It's not for boys, for little kids, it's for grown men. So it's, it's very tough playing, you know, at a Benedict um, where the band is right there you know, by your bench and you can't hear a thing. And you could you could tell that the players have so much energy. And, you know, it's great because the student athletes in our conference, they're very physically talented, but they're also very, very, you know, smart in executing whatever the coach has for their, you know, for their game plan. And I know Coach Maddox at, at uh, Benedict, he's a very, very good coach. So he, he had his guys, you know, ready to go when we played and, and that game was over very, very early, very early. Of course, what does the recruitment process look like for those prospective student athletes looking to play college basketball? Well, as you know, with the transfer portal and with, you know, students transferring every year and putting their names in the portal, it's, it's very, very, very um, saturated. And it's very, you have to do your homework. It's very um, time consuming because you have to sift through first the uh, transfers at the division one level, the division two level, division three NAI level. Then you have to look at junior college players and you always have to look at high school players. Some coaches are different when it comes to looking at, you know, younger players. I'm always looking at younger players. I actually saw a few uh, lower classmen high school players over the weekend that are gonna be really good. So you always gotta be aware of the best players that are out there, whether they're high school, junior college, or, or um, at the four-year level. So the recruitment process is, is, is ongoing. Obviously, we have a recruiting calendar. But to me, you can recruit in the office just like you can recruit out of the office. There's just times where you should be in the office, which is mandated by the NCAA. And then the times that the NCAA allows you to get out, you got to get out, you got to go see them. So you know, my biggest thing is seeing a full game film or watching them work out and play, you know, in adverse environments. Like I told you, the conference is very adverse. You have to deal with a lot of, you know, uh, adversity and you have to be mentally tough. So I want to see them in that same environment, whether they're a high school, junior college, or a four-year transfer. Of course, what are some of the things that you look at in those prospective student athletes on the high school level versus obviously at a JUCO school? Well, okay, that's a very good question because there is a distinction. The high school level, you want to see the talent. Um, you want to see the potential talent. You want to also see the toughness. So it starts with those two things. And right now, I would say the toughness is going to um, out, outweigh the, uh, the uh, talent a little bit because it doesn't matter how talented you are. If you're not tough and not mentally tough, you're not going to survive in the SIAC. Um, with junior college transfers, they have experience. So you want to see maturity. You want to see how mature they are. Um, you, want to, you want to look at their transcripts. You want to talk to their coaches. You want to talk to their high school coaches because they've been in junior college for a year at least, some of them two, some of them three with COVID. And if you don't hear of a maturity process, that they've had in the last couple of years, you you want to you want to understand why because 
every year you should mature if you're in if you're in school and there in, you do have to be patient as a coach for that process that's really the biggest distinction between high school players and uh, junior college transfers of course what does the official visit look like for those prospective student athletes looking to come to Albany well the good thing is we have a great campus atmosphere so it's going to start out with you know a meeting with you know myself and my staff and um, we're going to get someone to give them a tour, you know, of the, the both campuses. We actually have two campuses and then we want to bring them back and, you know, spend some more time with them and, you know, hopefully get them on the court and let them work out a little bit. And then I always end um, their visit with, with me, with a meeting with, you know, whoever they uh, are accompanied by, you know, whether they're, their parents, coaches or whatever in the office to really discuss you know, what they're looking for and what we're looking for and to see if it's a fit. And then obviously you have, you know, our student athletes that will kind of give them that, that student athlete perspective side and, and spend time with them, you know, with whoever our host is to kind of give them that, that uh, you know, mentioned uh, experience of being at Albany State, that coach, the coaching staff doesn't need to know everything, you know, so I kind of give them that time to kind of share and kind of talk to them about being on the campus and what it's like to be a student at Albany State. During the official visit, what is it like obviously seeing those prospective student athletes put on that yellow and blue jersey? Well, you know, the hey man, that, that blue and gold is that's that's what I let the uh the student athletes understand, the prospective student athletes understand. That's a big thing, you know, so it it has to look good on them. If it doesn't look good on them, then you know we can't take but it has to, they have to understand that it's a legacy that they're putting on. It's not just, a, you know, any random, you know, blue and gold. They have to understand the legacy and the tradition. And that's what we work every day to try to, you know, live up to. What are some of your future plans for the men's basketball program? Well, the first and foremost is that, you know, we, you mentioned this in our pre pre uh, talk that, you know, we, we the last time um, pre-pandemic, we played in the championship game of our conference tournament. So the first thing, is, you know, that, that year we won the division. Um, we, we have to get back to competing in our division. That's first and foremost. And, you know, obviously we want to compete in the conference tournament. But first and foremost, I always believe every year that you have to compete to win your division. And it's a very tough division. I actually thought that the East was was one of the top divisions in the country with with you know two uh, 20 win teams in the division with Morehouse and Benedict. You know, not many conferences can have two 20 win teams, you know, just in one division. So we we have a lot of work to do. And the second that we we lost in our conference tournament, I've been working towards that. So, you know, that that's the first thing is we have to compete to win our division. Our guys have to know that. And if they don't, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get some guys that do. What advice would you give those prospective student athletes that are in high school looking to play college basketball? That every day is an opportunity. I love when, you know, prospective student athletes say, hey, I'm just looking for an opportunity. If you're speaking to a college coach, it's an opportunity. Um, let me let me give them some advice based on experience. I was in a gym um, a couple of days ago to, to, to talk to a prospective junior college student athlete. And he didn't have sneakers because, you know, he was told he was just coming to meet with me. If you're in a gym, make sure you're ready to go. Um, anytime you're in front of a college coach, it's always an audition. And we know every player from basketball. So we want to see you play basketball. So don't go into a gym not ready to perform, not ready to work out. That's first and foremost. Always give your best. Treat every day like it's an opportunity. I know a lot of people have been watching, you know, the conference tournaments and, and seeing the uh, emotions and the ups and downs. But if you treat every day like it's championship day, then you're going to get what you're looking for. It's not going to come to you. You have to go get it. This is a very competitive uh, field, a very competitive business. Um, college coaches are looking at prospects every single day. 
And I can say that because they're not just looking at the future ones, they're looking at their own team. And with you know the transfer portal, every day you're evaluating your players. So there's always an opportunity and you would just have to be ready for that opportunity. That's the biggest advice I can give a, a, a prospective student athlete. Every word that you say, everything that you put on social media, every, um, every choice and decision that you make, what you wear into a gym, what you, what you, what you do in a classroom, you know, what you do in the store, you know, it is a chance to either achieve your dream or to be pushed behind. What advice would you give those college basketball players that are playing now, looking to go onto the NBA level or even internationally? The same, the same advice, the same advice. You are always being evaluated. I actually um, have a good friend that's an NBA agent and, and he calls me sometimes. I look, man, it's game day. I don't to talk to you right now, but he's constantly calling me because he's constantly evaluating talent. And I don't think um, college student athletes realize that they're really being evaluated for everything. Not just at the high D1, not just at the mid-major D1, every single level, they'll be, they're being evaluated. The best advice I can give is you gotta put up numbers with winning. You can't have one without the other. And if you do wanna win, if you, if you can pick between the two, you wanna win. You don't wanna have numbers on a losing team. You're, you're gonna get bypassed. You want to have numbers and win, which means you want your numbers to mean something. So that's the best advice I can give is just make sure you're in a winning environment and make sure that you're you're competing and put numbers to, to separate yourself because this is going to be a business once you're done. What advice would you give those future college coaches looking to get started in the industry just as you did? Uh, I, I'm gonna, I guess it's going to be the same thing. Every day is an opportunity. You know, I... I was a, um, a grad assistant at 30, and I remember, you know, someone younger than me that was a college coach, you know, telling me, you know, are you sure you're ready for this? And I had to make that decision because it was tough. Um, a lot of coaches look at, you know, college coaches at the D1 level, and they see the contracts, and they think that that's what college coaching is about. And it's kind of like what we tell our players, that's a small minority, a small minority are going to play high major college basketball, a small minority are going to go on to the NBA. So if you really love coaching, every, every opportunity is an opportunity. And like I told you from the start, the best coaches I've been around have been the guys that are not known for, you know, them being players. They're known for teaching and coaching, you know, so a great, great, great example. You tell me where did Popovich play. No one knows, but you know where he coached, you know, and he just, you know, um, became the all-time winning this uh, coach. So, you know, teaching is a lot more important in college coaching than anything else. If you are a great teacher, if you're a great communicator, you know, if, if they, they the, the student athletes are always looking, just like we tell, you know, parents with their children, they're always looking at what you do and not what you say, you know, and honestly, I hate to say it, but a lot, of, a lot of young people don't really care or remember when you played. You know, um, I grew up and I and I remember watching guys in the NBA and watching guys in college. And to meet them now, it's a it's a big thing to me. And then I look at my guys and these guys don't even know, you know, how good some of these coaches were when they played. So, you know, to 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 get into this, you know, business and this profession. You have to, you know, be humble to take any opportunity that comes. You have to treat that like it's the opportunity you want, which that you see on TV. And you always have to be trying to learn, you know, how to be better. That's great advice. Where can my listeners find you at on social media along with Albany State's men's basketball program? You can, you can find our program. And that's mainly where you'll find me um, at Albany uh, ST. Uh, capital U, capital M, capital BB. Thank you again, Coach Patrick Gale, for your interview, and best of luck in your future with the Albany State's men's basketball program. I appreciate you, Brandon. Thank you.
You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Facebook at Brandon Sports Talk, Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk, Twitter at Talk underscore Brandon, and you can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And you are again, Patrick Gale, for your interview, and best of luck in your future with the Albany State Men's Basketball Program. Thank you. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.